attention of the Minister to a group of former spouses who, due to miscalculations in their pension provision by the MOD, are now facing very uncertain futures. It seems there is a group of 126 women who have been affected by the mistake, and I think it is right and proper for the MOD to now take the steps necessary to ensure this doesn't happen again and to compensate those individuals affected, particularly where their financial situation and life circumstances have been substantively impaired. Three constituents came to see me in March of this year, and in accordance with their wishes, I shall not be disclosing their names to the House this evening. However, their experiences are fairly representative of the group of women affected. One individual, having made the difficult decision to divorce, asked for the details of her former husband's pension pot from the SPVA, the Service Personnel and Veterans Agency, who administer military pensions, in March 2010. Her husband's pension was in fact already in payment. The SPVA gave details and confirmed both on the telephone and in writing that my constituent would be able to take her pension from age 55 with no actuarial reduction being applied. Therefore, in April 2010, the judge was able to finalise her divorce, relying on that information provided by the SPVA and which had been confirmed in writing. The pension for my constituent came into payment and she undertook a number of financial obligations, feeling certain of a definite and defined monthly income payment for the rest of her life. She bought a property, undertook renovations on it as she sought to start her new life. It has since been discovered that in November 2010, the MOD were contacted by the DWP and made aware that an error had been made in the way that they had interpreted DWP legislation. It meant that actuarial reductions should have been applied to those former spouses who took a pension at age 55. However, none of the affected spouses were informed of this error, and their pensions continued to be paid from November 2010, when the MOD were first notified that an error had occurred, to spring 2012 when the MOD communicated that error to those affected and my constituent first approached me. On the 1st of March 2012, that is 16 months after the mistake had first come to light, my constituent was notified by phone that she would receive over 40% reduction in her pension, which would take effect in three months' time from that point. A letter confirming this arrived a few days later on the 5th of March. The stress and worry must have been unimaginable. Illness followed. She lost half a stone very quickly. She sold her car as she was so worried about the reduction in income and felt she had to rapidly downsize her lifestyle and felt obviously under an enormous degree of strain. Then, two months later... On the 13th of May 2012, she received a further communication from the SPVA informing her of another mistake, meaning she would be receiving more than the reduced amount, but still a 16% reduction on that which her divorce settlement had been based on and that she had been receiving payments for for the previous 18 months. I'm very sorry to say this individual is not an isolated example. A constituent of my honourable friend, the member for South Norfolk, who's with us this evening, had a similar experience. In her case, she took actuarial advice on advice from the MOD before she finalised the divorce. And acting on that advice, the judge awarded a clean break settlement comprising of 40% of her former husband's pension pot. On the basis of this guaranteed income, she secured a mortgage. She now finds herself with a 20% reduction in her income due to the miscalculation and she is looking at losing her house. She has been in hospital for emergency operations, treated for stress and is now 
on sleeping tablets. Will my honourable friend give way? Certainly will. Um, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for raising this subject and indeed in mentioning uh, my constituent. Does he agree with me that while the principles of good, good administration do require that public authorities such as the Ministry of Defence and the Veterans Agency do not make irregular payments, and one can understand that, um, principles of good administration also require public authorities to be held to their promises, especially when they have created a legitimate expectation, as in this case, which people have then acted upon. Does he therefore agree that the right route in this circumstance is generous compensation? Absolutely, I do. I fully endorse what my honourable friend has said, and I will come on to some specific issues that I hope the Minister will respond to in a minute. In what is an exceedingly traumatic time for anyone, going through a divorce and facing up to a new life, it is absolutely imperative that any agency of a government department gets the facts right first time particularly when dealing with issues which have, been, have painful and far-reaching implications. My constituent has told me that since the mistakes have been known, the SPVA, to their credit, have done their best to provide as much information as they can, for which she is uh, sincerely grateful. But information is one thing. We now need action leading to justice. The bottom line is that former husbands and wives, the courts, actuaries and mortgage companies all relied on the information provided to them by the MOD. They had no reason to believe it to be in any way incorrect, particularly in my constituents' case when the SPVA was asked directly whether there would be an actuarial reduction if she took her pension at 55. The SPVA wrote back in black and white on the 6th of April 2010 to say, no, this would not be the case. These mistakes have had serious repercussions on a number of divorce settlements, which have been decided on the basis of an erroneous, erroneous information, which means that the lifestyles the judges thought it fair for both parties to have after divorce are now not sustainable. In most cases of a so-called clean-break divorce, the course the court will not hear the divorces again. So the former wife, and it usually is the wife, has no legal recourse. It may be possible to go back to court under ancillary relief to look again at the finances, but the former husband may have to agree to this. So even if a court, court agreed to a rehearing, which in itself is expensive, many husbands, quite rationally and understandably, at one level, would not agree to this. I have figures provided by an actuary from Actuaries for Lawyers specialising in armed forces pensions who estimates my constituent's loss, what it will be, over her future expected lifespan. And I'd be happy to let the Minister see this. Indeed, the actuary himself will be happy to meet with the Minister and representatives of the relevant agency and department to explain how he arrived at these figures. But this evening... I would like to ask the Minister a number of questions. When exactly was the mistake made? Who notified the SPVA of the mistake? Who is accountable for the mistake? I do not wish to have a witch hunt, but as yet I have not received a satisfactory account of why the mistake was made, and as yet I am not confident it won't happen again. And I also want to know what actions the Minister and SPVA officials have or are taking or will take to ensure there isn't a recurrence of this mistake in future. My most pressing concern is why did it take so long for the MOD to contact those affected by the error? There was a 16-month window from when the mistake was discovered to those affected being contacted. This wait was unacceptable. I know the SDSR was completed, and from my recent experience on the Defence Com Committee, I know that there have been many complex changes taking place within the MOD. But still, the SPVA had a duty of care to get things right. That is their job. The argument that somehow we had a lot on cannot be used. As I've tried to stress, this error had a huge effect on, those vi on the victims. Some have become ill with chronic illness, 
Some find it hard to cope with paperwork as they try to get to the bottom of what's happened. Some are facing the risk of repossession. Many committed themselves to expenses that they cannot now maintain or would not have entered into. Many face adjustments to living that they would not have had to contemplate had their settlements been agreed on on the correct basis. I can't do justice to the misery and upset of so many families tonight, but I do hope the Minister will reflect fully on the circumstances surrounding my constituent and others. I want the Minister to give a categorical assurance that compensation will be awarded, not just to those who are able to challenge this through me or other MPs, but to the whole group of women. My constituent was awarded the the well-meaning but token amount of £250 to cover the inconvenience and uncertainty in a letter of the 13th of September 2012. Not everyone has been given this. Why? Is it just because she has been able to pursue the MOD? Some others have not been strong enough to do this. Some have been ill and not as persistent. There is a principle at stake here. The MOD sadly made a mistake and the miscalculations directly affected the choices made by this group of women and their former partners. I am aware that in previous correspondence I have had with the MOD on this issue that they have said that a hardship fund is available for those in need. Whilst this is very welcome, it does not address the real issue here, which is actually one of justice. The MOD ought to honour the assumptions made by the court. They have decided on what they thought to be a fair and just distribution of assets based on figures given to them by the SPVA. The decision has now been compromised through errors made not by these individuals but by the MOD. If we assume an average shortfall of 50,000 per person over their lifetimes, this would make the approximate compensation MOD need to find at perhaps 6 million. Given the lifetime of service these spouses have given through supporting their husbands, and in some cases forfeiting their own chances of a career through the frequent relocations necessary in many service households. The Minister should, I hope, order a full and complete compensation from these hardship funds. This should also include all reasonable legal costs, and here it would be helpful if the cost recoverable were defined. He should take whatever steps are necessary to establish where the error was made, and to ensure that those responsible are retrained to make certain it does not happen again. This government has made great steps with the military government during its time in office. This matter tests both the letter and spirit of it. I have the highest personal respect for the minister at the dispatch box, who, though only only in post for just over 40 days, I know has already cultivated widespread, widespread respect amongst many veterans' organisations. And I look forward to now to hearing a sympathetic and effective response. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I would like to start by congratulating my honourable friend, uh, the member for Salisbury, on securing this important debate. Um, I acknowledge his genuine concern for the individual cases he has mentioned. Uh, several members of his own constituency and one other represented by my honourable friend, the member for South Norfolk. I'm aware of the particular circumstances of the individual case that the honourable member for Salisbury has focused on and would like to explain to the House the error in pensions policy interpretation that has led to this situation and what has been done to support individuals who may have encountered financial and other difficulties as a result. For the benefit of the House, I will set out a little of the background, but may I start by saying that when a service person divorces or dissolves a civil partnership, we acknowledge that it can be a difficult and stressful time for both parties involved. I fully recognise, especially in the current climate, that to have received the news that the amount of pension that was already in payment would reduce, or in the case of deferred pensions would be less than expected will have been a great cause for concern. If any additional upset or distress has been caused as a result of errors made by the Department, then I offer my own very sincere apology to those affected. 
By way of introduction to this subject, pension credit members of former spouses or civil partners and members of our armed forces pension schemes who have been awarded a pension sharing order on divorce or the dissolution of a civil partnership. They are a special category member of the pension scheme that their former spouse or partner belongs to. So while they are members in their own right, the terms of their membership do not directly mirror the pension entitlement of their former spouse or partner. The legislation in this area is complex, as my honourable friend I think very well understands. Occupational pensions would normally become payable from age 65. New legislation was introduced in 2009 that allowed pensions to be brought into payment from the age of 55. The Ministry of Defence's pensions policy staff wrongly interpreted this legislation as allowing payment from the age of 55 without any reduction for early payment. However, my department's reading of the law was mistaken. The legislation was intended to make early payment an option, but if the pension was to be paid early, a corresponding reduction was also required. The error was first identified in the latter part of 2010 during an exercise to review the regulations for the Armed Forces Pension Scheme. As soon as it was, work began to amend the regulations of all of the pension schemes affected. My department's pensions policy staff instructed the Service Personnel and Veterans Agency to apply the correct policy to new cases from March 2011. Briefly, if I may, but yes. The member for Salisbury bringing this matter to the, to the House. Uh, he, he said in his introduction, life circumstances have been substantially affected. In the review, could I ask the Minister, would he be prepared to look at those who have been awarded compensation as well and the compensation they have been awarded has affected their benefits? That's for the wives and the family members as part of this review that he's hoping to do for the veterans. Thank you. I thank the honourable gentleman for that intervention. I hope by the time I get to the end of my speech, he will agree that we're doing our best to look at this issue to try and put it right. Hope he can make that judgment afterwards, but hopefully what I say will address the spirit of what he's asked. <coughs> um, the effect of misinterpreting the legislation was that 127 pensions already in payment to pension credit members required an adjustment to be made. In the majority of cases, this would result in a reduction. In March 2012, the department notified all those members affected and advised that the changes would come into effect from June this year. The average annual reduction to pensions in payment was approximately £783, although in some cases this will have been significantly higher. In April 2012, during business questions, my honourable friend asked the Leader of the House to seek an apology from the Ministry of Defence <clears throat> and to take corrective action that would in effect restore the pensions to the original amount. The Leader asked for urgent inquiries to be made to establish whether any injustice had occurred. My predecessor, Andrew Robertson, the Honourable Member for South Leicestershire, wrote to the Honourable Member on the 10th of May, confirming that, while an error had occurred in allowing the pensions to be paid on the wrong basis, legally there was no provision to continue paying pensions knowingly at the incorrect rate. My predecessor also confirmed that when the pensions were being adjusted to the correct rate, a calculation error was made by the Department. This further mistake was identified quickly and revised calculations were issued to those affected as soon as practicable. When the correct methodology was applied, the reductions in pension amounts in all of those cases were less than previously advised. In a few cases, the pensions were actually increased. And for some pension credit members who had received lump sums as part of the divorce settlement, these also increased. As I'm sure the House will agree, where there's no legal entitlement to continue paying a pension at the incorrect rate, it must be put right without undue delay. Regrettably, in this instance, the matter was not addressed as quickly as it ought to have been and payments were allowed to continue. Again, I apologise for this. When the extent of both these errors was recognised, in the spring of 2012, the Ministry of Defence did its best to put this right. As a first step, and having sought approval from Her Majesty's Treasury, the overpayments to 127 pension credit members, totalling uh, over £176,000, were waived, and no recovery action was pursued. In addition, in recognition of the need for those affected to adjust to a, to a reduced income in future, a period of three months' grace was given to those whose pension was already in payment.
For completeness, the House should also know that these same errors also affected 417 deferred pension credit members. For the record, deferred members are those whose pension had not yet come into payment. These members were also written to in March 2012 and advised that the amount of pension they were expecting at age 55 was incorrect. They could still choose to take their pension early at age 55 or wait until age 65, but it would need to be recalculated. Once deferred members' pensions were also calculated on the correct basis, the vast majority of deferred members saw their annual pension actually increase above the original estimated value. All those affected were offered the opportunity to discuss their situation with the Service, Personnel and Veterans Agency Welfare Service. In March 2012, when the original pension recalculations were completed and the reductions in pension known, the SPVA identified those with the most significant reductions and those who may be particularly vulnerable and arranged for a welfare manager to visit them personally. These visits were completed wherever possible throughout March and this action put this group of individuals in direct contact with a welfare manager should they require further or ongoing support. In each case where there was a welfare contact, a full case assessment was carried out. This looked at the individual circumstances and included potential entitlement to other benefits. There were a number of pension credit members where further support and advice has been given and where appropriate assistance has been provided in applying for further DWP benefits, for example, disability living allowance and carer's allowance. The potential financial difficulties that the adjustment might have caused some individuals was also recognised. <clears throat> Claims for hardship where they could be substantiated could be discussed in confidence with the welfare service and submitted for consideration. In total, five claims for financial hardship, six claims for a consolatory payment and two claims for other financial losses have been received, considered and compensation paid where this was appropriate. This route remains open to those pension credit members, including my honourable friend's constituents, who may be facing genuine financial hardship as a result of the changes to their annual pension. I can appreciate that making any such claim is a difficult step to take, but I can assure my honourable friend that this would be handled in a sensitive manner in conjunction with our welfare service. They are there to offer support and I would urge all of the affected individuals to make contact to see what can be done. I was pleased to hear my honourable friend recognising the efforts that my department has made in providing information to his constituent. I can assure the House the department has learned some valuable lessons from its mistakes in this case. Improved processes have been put in place to enhance the training of and more effective working between pensions policy and operational delivery staffs. This has included a strong focus on ensuring that the potential implications of future legislative changes are correctly interpreted and fully understood. I have listened to the points that my honourable friend has raised today, and while it is perfectly true that an error was made in the interpretation of legislation in this complex area, and that this was further exacerbated by errors in our calculations, for which I have already apologised, I urge the House to recognise that my department has acted to minimise the effects the error has caused. We have not sought to recover the overpayments. We have given three months' grace to adjust to the reduced amount of pension, offered welfare support where this is required or considered appropriate, and made arrangements for claims to be considered where financial hardship has been demonstrated. My Honourable Friend has made considerable efforts in supporting this group of individuals through all possible parliamentary channels. This is evidence of his commitment to champion their cause to seek to ensure that no injustice has taken place. My Honourable Friend has indicated that some form of compensation is due to those affected by these errors. I would agree. There is no statutory entitlement to maintain these pensions at the full amount. I can assure the House that the MOD has in place a comprehensive process to compensate these individuals where financial hardship has resulted because of changes to their pension. The process will look at individual cases and assess the impact these errors have had. If individuals are not satisfied with the outcome, of course it is open to them to pursue the matter of any compensation through the legal system. But I would conclude by urging those individuals affected to engage or re-engage with our welfare system so that we can look at each individual case in the round and do our best to put things right. We must make amends and we will seek to do so. The question is that this House do now adjourn. As many of that opinions say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.